Thank you so much. Um, yes, I will say this is a Bitcoin dress. It has the uh, Genesis block of Bitcoin on it. Uh, so if you ever want to see what's on the Bitcoin block, just let me know. Um, so yeah, if we can switch to my first slide, please. Can, can we get my presentation up? Okay, well, let's wait a second. It's not like we work in tech. Oh, amazing, thank you. Yes, so I asked uh, Bob and Sarah, the organizers, what should I talk about? And they said, well, you can talk about whatever. I suggested a couple of things, uh, including like AI stuff, but they said, no, we want you to talk about uh, the troubles that we have with decentralized autonomous organizations. Now, I appreciate that many people here are not very much in the Ethereum world, but who knows what a DAO is? Okay, so most of you do. Great. That's a good starting point. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, famous, uh, famous saying, history never repeats itself, but it always rhymes. Uh, I'll be talking about troubles that uh, we are seeing in decentralized autonomous organizations, not necessarily things that you may be thinking about. And my thesis is that these five points are reasons why we are not seeing such a great uptake of what I think might be one of the most important uh, inventions in the future of work and how we organize humans. But who am I and why am I standing here? Uh, that's me in three versions. Uh, I do a lot of public speaking. I used to work for Hyperledger as director of ecosystem, and I did a lot of speaking around um, permission blockchains and enterprise blockchain and all that. Before that, I actually started my career at Blockstream. I was one of the first employees at Blockstream in 2014. So I am a Bitcoin person in heart. Uh, but re most recently, I've been with uh, Consensus where I'm leading the Web3 strategy uh, or Web3 engagement and DAO strategy team, uh, thinking about how consensus engages with DAOs and Web3 projects. How do we become more, more Web3 native? And what I think is the most fun challenge, how do we turn all of our 800 employees into contributors? And that's not as easy as you'd think it would be. I also row. I also row in costumes, but most of the time I row for Cambridge in actual rowing gear, and I used to do horse riding. That's my fun fact about me. So why should you care? That's a good question. What I see when I think about the world is that we actually started as decentralized uh, society. If you think about it, you know, 70,000 years ago, we kind of started moving around, but we couldn't even communicate. We were so decentralized that we wouldn't be even able to find a common language. It's only about 50,000 years ago that we started establishing communication. Um, and once we started communicating, we went from these, you know, people running around and catching deers and whatever other dinosaurs there were. Yes, not dinosaurs, but whatever animals were there. Uh, to actually thinking, how can we coordinate ourselves to be more efficient and be better? And that's when we went into the agricultural stage, where we started actually sitting together and saying, you, Jake, will be doing all of the crops, and you, Jane, will go and hunt that bear, because you, got, you are good at this. And then we moved into markets and trades, because, hey, actually, if we have common markets, that's better. So you can see how, and then 200 years ago, steam engine was created in mass production. So actually, centralization is something that is good in a lot of ways. It makes us more efficient. It makes us better. And the same thing kind of happened with internet. We started off completely random, and then we established the communication standards, the TCP IP. We started to consolidate access to resources, created marketplaces, and now we are crea creating complex economic coordination. And that happens every time when a great innovation starts. It starts small and potentially quite decentralized, and then slowly centralizes. So, on the other hand, we created decentralized autonomous organizations thinking about, you know, revolutionizing, and that's something I'll talk about in a second, revolutionizing the way that we think about human coordination. 
And there are five major functions of a decentralized organization. So first of all, it is used for DAOs, uh, sorry, for governance. <laughs> Um, they can be used to decide the direction and uh, for of a project or community. Then there is fund management, right? We raise money, we distribute the funds for particular projects or calls, um, and we are doing it in a much more democratic way. There is community building. We are able to coordinate people, bring people together that have shared interests and, and goals. We use it for decision making about big projects and small projects, and we allocate resources. So DAOs are a really cool way of bringing people together under a shared umbrella to do something without having a central authority. However, there are a few mistakes that we are making in the process, and one of the first ones that I would want to point out is revolution rather than evolution. And back to, you know, how we think about how we kind of ended up as a community or as a, as a uh, humanity, and what, is, what, what inclined people to create or Vitalik to write about decentralized autonomous organizations was this thinking of, well, right now we have governments that are really centralized, really bad. All we want is to shed this all apart and be like completely anarchist in a way, right? We don't need any structures. Slowly, we are now learning that actually structures are kind of okay, and DAOs now have OKRs. And they have, uh, you know, we are starting to think how do we employ people? Because we need contracts to then fire those contributors who are not actually contributing. So the first kind of boom and the revolution that we are trying to, uh, to introduce didn't really go as well as, we, as it could have gone because we are not learning from the mistakes of the past. And those mistakes is how we developed governments and how badly the governments are run today. We should be looking at the history and saying, hey, you know, these are the mistakes, let's correct them, rather than re completely change the status quo. Um, second problem I think is uh, that DAOs have a lot is the, um, the overhead. So there is this concept, I'm sure you heard about it, that is called the bike shed problem. It was uh, introduced um, in the 70s, uh, where a scientist called uh, Parkinson provided this example of a functional committee who is supposed to, be, uh, to approve the plans for building a nuclear power plant. And actually, they spend majority of their discussion time on the uh, easy to grasp issues, such as the materials to be used uh, for the uh, staff bicycle shed. So what he said was the time spent on any item of the agenda will be in inverse proportion to the sum of money involved. And that's what we see in DAOs. Peop there are concepts that are really hard to grasp and DAOs start to vote on it. But because it's so hard, we just go with whatever the smartest person in the room said. And then there are problems that are very obvious and easy, like, you know, what color scheme should we be using? And that re requires a lot of conversation because everybody has an opinion. So that ability to express your opinions hits us both ways. On one hand, we don't, we don't pay attention and spend time on the things that are really important, but then we spend a lot of time on the things that are really unimportant, and that's why Building a DAO requires a lot of um, very mindful community building and coordination. In traditional companies, you will have HRs, and no, I don't love HR teams. Sorry if someone's from HR. Uh, but we have kind of structures to coordinate the teams and to talk together. And in DAOs, we are trying to kind of say, oh, it will all resolve itself. We don't even need code of conduct, yet we do. And then there's the problem of recentralization that we are absolutely headed for. Um, there's this really, really interesting paper that came out um, earlier this year where the scientists tried to apply the Nakamoto coefficient and the Gini coefficient to DAOs to look at how truly decentralized or whether DAOs are decentralized. So the Gini coefficient can be used to measure the inequality in the distribution of any fungible good. In that case, they used it for voting power. 
And the values range from zero, which indicates that there is perfect equality, and 1.0, which means the highest level of inequality, so the worst situation. In most countries, when we take the Gini coefficient when it comes to wealth distribution, uh, the Gini coefficient it is somewhere between 0.7 and 0.85. Now, if you look at this table here, you will see, so remember, one is the worst, right? If we take top, to whatever it is, 20 DAOs that are here, as of January 31st, 2023, the best we can achieve is gas DAO, which is 0.88. Everything else is 0.9 and above. This is terrifying, because this means that there are so many, so, so few people that hold so much power in this supposedly decentralized world. If you take the Nakamoto coefficient that it measures how decentralized, decentralized the system is based on how many wallets do you have to control to have 50% or more voting power, it goes even worse. So ENS has 19 delegates. You have to control 19 wallets to be able to control the voting power. If you go for a Uniswap, it's as little as 11, hop, six. And I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not against any of those DAOs, but it really, really shows us that theoretically, yes, everybody has voting power, and if you own the token, you can vote. But actually, between the hoarders and the like, super strong wallets, and the way that the whole industry or ecosystem is running right now, actually, everything's decided from the get-go. There isn't this truly beautiful idea that, like, if I have an, a, a proposal, I can just go and make that proposal, and community vote will vote on it and evaluate it because it's so great. The reality is that if I don't have um, support of those 11 wallets on Uniswap, I'm not going to pass my proposal. And that's just, you know, it really feels sometimes, and uh, my team participates in all, a lot of the governance, and truly sometimes we look at ourselves and we're like, this just feels like uh, West Wing, really. And then there is not learning from, from the past. Um, this is a fresco uh, by um, Amb Ambrogio Lorenzetti, sorry, my Italian is not up to scratch. Um, he painted this uh, three se series of three frescoes um, where he differentiates between uh, a good and a bad government. And you can't really, well, it's they are quite destroyed, but basically the one up there is, describes a beautiful situation when the government is flourishing and their whole community is just living happily ever after. And then, this one on the down here is, uh, presents a government that is um, rotten and uh, kind of poisonous and, and is not functioning very well. Um, that governance, healthy governance and having a healthy ecosystem is something that we really, really need, whatever organizations we have. And it doesn't matter that it's autonomous or decentralized. Because something that, again, we need to realize is that Indeed, the governance is automated in the way that if, you, if we make a decision, we build it into a smart contract and then smart contracts get executed. But we need humans to make those decisions, right? We need humans to evalu evaluate those decisions. They will not be made on their own or just magically. And we are forgetting that human factor in the DAO ecosystem. And I would even claim that we are forgetting that human factor in Web3 in general. Um, and finally, um, if you look at how, what do, for, forgetting what we think about governments and, uh, you know, I'm from Poland, you might know that Polish government right now is a little bit of a shambles. Uh, so I'm not saying that governments are great, but there are certain things that governments learned how to do very, very well and very efficient. One of them is making sure that people actually participate in votes. Some governments enforce it, right? You have to pay a fine if you don't want to vote. But most importantly, voting is rare. You, we don't ask citizens or governments don't ask citizens to say, hey, you know, 
you should vote on every single thing. We have votes that are like those big campaigns, we get people together and we do it. Secondly, these decisions are very simple. It's like tick across here. And that, that's all the decision you have to make. Yes, that usually is based on TV advertising and some kind of a very weird campaign when it comes to choosing uh, your, your ruler, your president. But it is a very simple decision and the process is really simple. It's quite interesting to, to, if you compare the tax systems in different countries and voting systems in different countries. Because voting is something that is greatly, high participation in voting is, a, is something that is greatly in the interest of the government, every government has almost the same process. Sometimes you can do it online, sometimes you have to show up in person, but basically there are names and you tick a box next to the name, you can do an X or a tick, that's it. And that's like, I lived in several countries, every time I participate in the vote, that works the same way. Tax system, because actually governments are very happy if you don't pay the tax on time because then they can fine you, is very different and very complicated in every, every single country. Um, but the more we want people to actually succeed, the more simple the processes can be. You have the education, right? We all learn about the process of how do we participate, how do you... Uh, do you participate in voting, whereas DAOs don't do that. We have very little education about the importance of being an active member of a DAO. They focus on human, right? We, we try to really get through to, to our citizens, and we really spend the money and vo separate money and vote, which is something that DAOs are slowly starting to do. But right now we have this conflict in DAO ecosystem where Usually, if I obtain a token, there are two reasons why I would buy a token, right? One, I just don't want to get rich. I think this token will go up. I'm just buying it. Second, I really care about this project. I want to participate in its governance. Well, there are very two conflicting theories. Now, if I bought the token because I want to get rich, I'm still eligible for a vote, but I don't really want to vote because I don't care about that project. If I obtain that token, because I really care about the project and I care about the voting rights, well, if the, vote, if the project succeeds, then I'm more incentivized to sell the token, there, therefore get rid of my voting rights, but then I won't be able to help the project succeed. So it's a very conflicting situation, and now we're seeing things like voting tokens, lockups, and things like that, or staking that allows you to participate in the votes of a DAO if you really care. But it's that kind of thinking around how do we simplify the decision making and how we, do we uh, separate those two issues is, is very, very important. And then finally, the tech -centr centric design of uh, user experience. We, I think this is a, a problem that we have over and over again where we really don't think about the human. One of the biggest or most challenging thing for me in the, our ecosystem is that we don't really ch chase the bad guys. Like you hear about a hack or you hear about someone, you know, losing a lot of money in their wallet, but there isn't a body in our whole broad ecosystem that is specifically devoted to chasing the bad actors. Police, reg regular police, not really. They, they don't care and they don't understand our industry. But we are not self-policing ourselves. We haven't established a group that would say, we will investigate every hack. You just hear about them and they're like, oh yeah, well, I'm sorry you lost your money, bye now. And we really need to start thinking of that because we won't get adoption if that's, um, uh, if, if that's not resolved. So there we go, I had 20 minutes and I have 22 seconds to go. So I can't probably take questions now, but if you want to chat to me or tell me that I'm full of BS, then come talk to me later. No, Thank you. No. <laughs> We can definitely do a, do a couple of questions. So my favorite thing to say is, is that DAOs are neither decentralized nor autonomous. So, I mean, the whole code is law thing pretty much went very much by the wayside. And at the end of the day, it's three guys or seven guys around a multi-sig at 3 a.m. going, can you sign 
transaction number 257 mm -hmm. and uh, which number yeah. uh, over a Zoom call. Um, do you think that we can ever get to organizations actually being autonomous? Because at best yet they're distributed because people are in different jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that, I don't think that DAOs today are what DAOs will be finally. I think that we started with a very philosophical concept. Like in theory, it would be beautiful if they are decentralized and autonomous and automated and all that stuff. And then we went through this process, as with everything that we seem to have be going through in humanity, where we're like, oh, no, actually, we need to introduce those different steps. So we can't have the randomness. But there are things that are really important in DAOs that I hope that will be preserved, like the idea that it doesn't matter what you're officially responsible for. You can chime in into anything that you want to be part of. So imagine, you know, a marketing person that actually happens to have experience in user design or is just a user of the product and they participate in the user studies and say, hey, we need to change this, this and that in the product design to make it better. So I think, I think that it is future of work. We just need to take the concepts and apply them rather than build something okay. from scratch. So do you see the potential advancements or clarifications happening through projects like Lao Official and you know people that are offering jurisdictional uh, legality so you can do your payroll that have the crypto recognition in various jurisdictions? Yeah. Um, I think that there is a lot of really good stuff happening right now as we are learning and becoming more and more formal about uh, those DAOs. Uh, exactly the projects that you mentioned, the whole idea of incorporating your DAO, having people responsible, also talking to the regulators around who is it, who is responsible for, for it when it goes badly, who is responsible for the decision. Because right now, as you probably all know here, if you're part of a DAO and some, the DAO votes of something, like, I don't know, using nukes, you're responsible for that, even if you didn't participate in that decision. From a legal perspective, we are all, as participants of the DAO, responsible for it. So I think that working with government or regulators to clarify that, as with anything in our space, same with crypto, same with, with all the other things, we, we need clarity to know where, where it's good to go. Cool. Um, I can take one or two questions because uh I find it quite unfair to just have to rush through that <laughs> beside myself. Does anybody have a question for Anta besides no. me? You guys are like really not in the Dallas space, right? <laughs> I mean, this is really a proof of work, a proof of work room. I got it back there in the corner. All right. Okay, cool. There's a microphone going over there. Mr. Nick Laz, hey. saving um, the day. I always ask the hard questions. So right. could you envisage and or do you know of a DAO that exists outside of IRL real life jurisdictions? Do you know of a DAO that exists outside of being in Wyoming or being in Ireland or being where else that has no legal jurisdictional presence? No. There is always, you, at the end of the day, you have to always somehow define, if you want a formal DAO, you, if, you know, yes, I know a bunch of friends that call themselves a DAO, <laughs> and they even issue tokens, right? That we, we have that. But at the end of the day, we all, you, you need to have some jurisdictional um, uh, attachment, um, whether it's Wyoming, whether it's, you know, there, there are a few communities that, doing, that are doing a thing where they establish a foundation that is kind of the responsible legal body, but the DAO is not, like, the DAO is an advisory to that foundation, so they are not attached to any jurisdiction. But that's, yeah, at the end of the day, you have to be registered somewhere. Okay, so let me ask you a last um, philosophical question. Um, Jared Hope of, of Status, when uh, we were talking about DAOs in, in 2017, 2018, uh, uh, postulated that a DAO is the sum total of all of the individual contracts that people enter to get into, into together um, to manifest something, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? And some people would make the argument that Bitcoin, actually, 
or any decentrally, you know, um, um, deployed proof of work coin is actually the best example of a DAO because nobody actually has control of mm -hmm. the network other than from the point at which it was deployed. How do you feel about that I, definition of a DAO? I mean, uh, yes, I like this a lot. I would say uh, that Bitcoin is also, to a certain degree, and we can look at it from different perspectives, but it's quite centralized. When it comes to core contributors, you can almost name a name, maybe not by name, but by their nickname or something like that. So I think that the whole, we, we need to learn, work through, through the decentralization and through openness and accept possibly a certain level of centralization. But in what you're saying around DAOs, I do think that probably Bitcoin might be one of the better DAOs out there. Yay, got her. <laughs> 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 I've been unfair. Thank you so much, Merta. Thank you.